My name is Camille Parmesan. I'm uh, at the University of Texas in integrative biology. Very broadly, what I'm interested in are what the impacts of climate change have been on wildlife. When you say global warming, people think of absolutely everywhere getting hotter. And really, in truth, what's happening is that most places are getting hotter, but some places are getting cooler and some places aren't changing. So now we talk about climate change. And what that means is that as we've had a rise in greenhouse gases and principally carbon dioxide, which is what comes out of your cars, this has caused the Earth to retain more heat. And as it retains more heat globally, this has big impacts on local and regional climates. One of the things that I've studied is what has been really response of animals and plants to that gradual rise in temperature over the years, over the past hundred years. There are two main types of responses that you can look at. And one of them uh, is very intuitive, and that's that the timing of events changes. So if you think of winter being warmer, which it has become warmer, then it's easy to imagine that spring might start earlier. And in fact, that's what we're seeing. Spring is about two weeks earlier now than it was 30 or 40 years ago. And that's due to this gradual rise in temperature. That is one of the big types of impacts that occur. The other one is perhaps not as obvious to people until they think about it for a minute. And that's that where an animal exists, the, the area that it occupies on this planet is often usually driven by climate. And so as climate change occurs, then the distribution of a lot of those animals and plants you might expect to move around. And we expect them to move in particular directions. As the gradually North America warms, a lot of species are going to tend to move up towards Canada and up the mountains from the lowlands. So a second type of thing you can look for are these bigger changes in the distributions of plants and animals. When I first got interested in the impacts of climate change, I chose to work on this one species of butterfly that lives in the western USA, all the way from Mexico up to Canada. And uh, I chose it because it's, we know it's very sensitive to climate from a lot of research that people have done, and it doesn't move very much as an individual. So if it was going to change where it was living, it would be a very gradual process which might match the sort of gradual increase in temperature that we've had. In the western U.S. has risen in temperature by about one degree Fahrenheit over the last hundred years. And the question is, has where this butterfly lived changed over the past hundred years? And to get that information, I went around to museums and looked at museum specimens to see where people had recorded finding it in the early 1900s. Once I had that, I had to figure out whether anything had changed. So I spent about four and a half years going around to as many of those sites as I could, documenting whether or not the population was still there. In some places it was, and in other places the population had gone extinct, even though the habitat actually looked fine. This butterfly was much more likely to have gone extinct at the southern edge of the range in Mexico and at lower elevations. And in Canada and up at the highest elevations of the Sierra Nevada, it was doing really, really well. This is exactly what you'd expect as a response to the one degree Fahrenheit temperature rise as this butterfly is slowly shifting where it lives to more northerly and more um, higher elevation areas. It took me five or six years to actually come up with the answer as to whether climate change had affected this butterfly. But when I did come up with it, it had a big impact because it was the first solid documentation of a species, a whole species that has been affected by recent global warming. My research on the response of these butterflies to temperature rise is what we think of as being basic biology, basic research. But because it involves response to climate change, it immediately comes to attention of a lot of policy people and a lot of international organizations. And one of these that I became involved with very soon after getting into the climate change field is something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it's a United Nations body that's comprised of scientists uh, that are come out with reports that are intended to be a global assessment of the state of climate science as well as the impacts of climate change on both uh, natural biological systems as well as humans. The aim of the panel is not to 
present policymakers with specific recommendations, but rather to present the science in order for the policymakers to come up with their own recommendations. The last IPCC report came out in 2001, which is what I was involved in as a lead author. At that point, a lot of nations were still debating whether or not to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, which is an international agreement to reduce carbon emissions. When our report came out, when they saw that not only the climate science was at a stage where uh, the climate scientists were attributing the warming of the past 30 years to increases in carbon gases, but also that it was having huge biological impacts. Those two things together convinced many, many nations to start ratifying the Kyoto Protocol. And at this point, out of the 180 nations that are involved in it, um, all of them have signed and most of them have either ratified or started ratification uh, procedures. A second type of um, policy relevant work that I'm doing is work with the IUCN where I'm chair of a task force on climate change impacts. The IUCN is also called the World Conservation Organization and their aim is really to provide information and uh, assistance to managers and to conservation efforts around the world in order to preserve biodiversity. So that's the big goal is we need to preserve biodiversity. And they've come out with something called the Red List of Endangered Species, which is widely used by many, many organizations in determining whether or not a species needs special protection. Now, up to now, they've really been focused on what we think of as the typical conservation pro problems, habitat loss, um, pollution, toxicity in, in the air and the water. But recently, they've realized they need to start including climate change as one of the things that are harming species on this planet. What we're hoping to do is, over the next two years, come up with some very specific recommendations for con conserving biodiversity in the face of climate change, and particularly for those regions of the Earth that are hotspots for biodiversity, such as in northeastern Australia, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, parts of Central and South America that are real hotspots for tropical species. And it's going to be a very difficult task, but it's one in which the scientists who are doing the groundwork really need to be involved in because science is occurring so rapidly in this field that you, one, you can't wait till publications come out, but also um, it's very important to have the basic researchers working with the managers and the policymakers in order for that the science is interpreted correctly. Because this is one case in which it's really important to get it right and to not just kind of wave your hands and try to do something approximate.